thank you and good afternoon everybody. I'm Lori Ann Cerullo. I'm the president of the Women's Metropolitan Golf Association. I thank you all for attending. Um, I know that, uh, that there's a lot going on in the world and I hope this finds you all safe and well. Uh, welcome to our swing series. It's the first of our series and we're doing things differently because of what's going on um, out there and we are offering this first series and I am so thankful for Kiona or excuse me Kiona's sponsorship uh, with this meet and greet with Patty Sheehan and with that um, I'm going to turn it over to Tammy Fuji who is the co-owner of Kiona and ask her for a brief history of the company her partnership with Diane Kluch and the connection to Patty. And with that, Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori Ann. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, as Lori Ann mentioned, uh, Diane and I, my partner, started Kinona about three and a half years ago. And it was, uh, it was something that uh, we always wanted to do. We wanted to build a company um, and build great golf, uh, women's golf apparel. Um, and we felt like it was a, a, a huge market opportunity um, for women to like feel really great and comfortable and look really stylish um, on a golf course. We felt like there wasn't a brand out there that really did it. And especially, you know, as we get a little bit older, um, you know, we were finding that, you know, the scores weren't the right lengths and, and the product just wasn't right for us. So we really do appeal to a little bit more, um, I'll say, of a mature customer. Um, all of our fabrics are all Italian. They're all um, UPF 50. They all have UPF 50 built into it, um, meaning it it's all has uh, built-in sun protection. And we have um, shaping details built into all of our product. Uh, Kinona means shape in Hawaiian, and that's why you know we felt like it was really important to incorporate that into the brand. Uh, Diane and I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Patty and Rebecca last. January at the ANA in Mission Hills, um, and uh, and we've since um, met re met them again in, in in Hawaii. Speaking of Hawaii, um, this past November, and and uh, solidified our partnership. And and uh, so Patty and Rebecca are um, on our board of advisors for Kinona, and we uh, couldn't be happier and more thrilled to have them um, as part of our uh, as part of our broader team. So um, anyway, we're super excited to hear what they have to say today. Tammy, I'll turn it over to Beth. Yeah, Tammy, thank you so much to you and Diane. This is really a treat for our, our membership. This week would have been our team matches and uh, to Patty and Rebecca, that means that 900 women in the tri-state area would have been playing match play golf yesterday which I think we all can take note was absolutely gorgeous. Oh. Um, <laughs> which uh, usually is not always the case for us. We play in the freezing rain or whatever, but it, this is a great replacement, so thank you. Um, of course. So everybody knows, on the left is Rebecca Gaston, and that is Patty's wife, beautiful wife. Uh, and for those who don't know, Patty is a World of Golf Hall of Famer, which means uh, she has had six professional major wins, 29 wins on the LPGA Tour, eight amateur wins, seven additional wins, which included the 1992 British Open, and six Solheim appearances and a Curtis Cup experience. Uh, so for those of us who like to brag about winning 15 points in team matches, we got nothing <laughs> on you. <laughs> so got nothing. Um, so before we uh, hit highlight some of those golf events, I'd love for you to share with everyone a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up? How'd you get introduced to golf? Well, thank you, Beth, and uh, thanks for both uh, Rebecca and I for having us on today. Um, we love doing these types of things, um, but uh, I originally am from Vermont. Uh, Middlebury, Vermont, and um, my parents both played golf. Uh, my father was a uh, avid golfer and a six handicap. My mom was an 18 handicap, and uh, I used to caddy for my mom when I was little, and I got um, 75 cents for 18 holes, um, and that was at Middlebury uh, Golf Course, nine-hole course, so I grew up on a nine-hole course. Um, I started playing golf at about three or four years old. And I had one club and it was a two iron. And of course, everybody can hit a two iron perfectly at four years old, right? So 
that was my only club and I was, I had one rule and that was not to lose my club. So I don't think I ever did lose it, but I think we gave it away somewhere because I don't have it anymore. But um, we moved west when I was 10 and uh, really um, started playing a lot more golf um, because obviously in Vermont, you don't play a whole lot of golf, only in like two or three months. Um, so I just, I went west and um, my parents moved next to a golf course and they joined it and um, yeah, I just sort of took off from there. So before you moved west, I believe that you had a, uh, you were a bit of a skier. So why don't you tell everybody about that? <laughs> okay, so my, my dad was an Olympic ski coach in 1956 and I was uh, conceived at the Olympics in Cortina, Italy. Um, so all of us, I uh, have three older brothers and uh, myself, we all ski raced when we were young. Um, so uh, I, I kind of just tagged along with whatever it was my older brothers were doing. And at that time they were all ski racing, so I did too. And then uh, when we moved west, um, I, I kind of got tired of ski racing and boot packing the uh, deep snow that we get out west. And uh, so I decided that I wanted to quit ski racing. And it took me a long time before I was able to tell my dad, uh, build up enough courage to tell him that I didn't want to ski race anymore. So um, one day I finally did. And he said it was the happiest day of his life because he didn't have to go up and um, <laughs> carry um, you know, flagpoles and do all the manual labor that uh, people have to do to help out junior skiers um, ski race. So um, that was a great, great day for me and a great day for him. And uh, since then, I've been um, playing other sports too, but um, I really started falling in love with the game of golf. Uh, Patty, one of uh, our members, Terry Lyons, uh, knew about your ski career, so she wanted to know how did the experience of being a 13-year-old champion uh, help you become a successful golfer? Uh, and what about skiing also helped your golf game? Because I know I remembered hearing something that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I competed in a lot of different sports and um, skiing was one of them, but I, I think that skiing and being on the hill and learning how to balance um, uh, made a big difference in how I um, kind of learned how to play golf because golf is not played, as you all know, is not played on a flat surface. You have to know your ups and downs and side hills and in all kinds of angles. And so um, I think the balance of the ski racing um, really helped me with the balance in golf. Um, but I also feel that um, because uh, I was able and, and obviously allowed to play different sports growing up, that that was a huge um, influence on how I was able to uh, learn my body and how it reacted in different situations and different um, physicalities, um, and, and it really helped as I grew up understand how to relate to my body and what it could and couldn't do. Um, and I think it's really important for parents to understand that it's probably a good idea to let your kids do a whole bunch of different sports and let them understand uh, their own bodies and how it relates and what they love about each and every sport or don't love. Um, because it's really important that they figure out which one is the one that that child loves, not the parent, the one the child loves. Um, so my parents let me do that. And for some reason I chose golf and, um, I'm so glad that I did. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, so you guys, you go out West and you start, you know, focusing more on golf. So were you doing junior golf? Did yeah, I did some for yeah. girls. Yeah, I did some junior golf. Um, there weren't many junior golfers in Reno, Nevada, when I really was playing competitively, if you can call it competitively. Right. Uh, there weren't many of us playing, so I played a lot with my brothers. I played with their friends, um, uh, but I, you know, I won a lot of their little junior tournaments because there weren't many girls that played, and they were pretty terrible. So but were you playing with other girl against other girls or were you playing against the boys? I was playing against the girls. Um, okay. but I also 
was beating a lot of the boys too, which, you know, like it or not, that's <laughs> the way things work sometimes. <laughs> Uh, so now tell everybody, so you started off at the College of Nevada, I believe, but then you transferred when? So and I uh, spent my first three years of college golf at the University of Nevada in Reno. And um, because the girls on the golf team decided that they didn't want to play golf anymore, I was the only one left. So after three years of practicing with the men, basically, on the men's team, um, they decided to take away women's golf at Nevada. And so I was able to just um, basically freely go to wherever I wanted to go. And so I transferred to San Jose State um, my last year of eligibility. I didn't have to wait out a year or anything like that. So that was great. Um, so I went down to San Jose State and uh, Mark Gale was our coach. And I had some great teammates. And one of them was, is an exceptional Hall of Famer herself, Julie Inkster. So um, she and I played one and two on the team the entire time that I was there for that year, and uh, it was great. I mean, we are great friends, and we're great competitors, and we competed a lot against each other, and obviously against each other trying to make that number one spot on the team. And then after um, we left college, we went on to play the tour together and um, really competed a lot against each other there, too. So... Uh, we have a lot of um, respect for each other, and uh, and it was a great experience. Just curiously, Patty, was was turning pro always was always the plan to turn pro? No, I um, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I was going to college to uh, become a PE teacher, okay. um, and then I realized that I wasn't very good at teaching, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I guess I just sort of parlayed that into uh, playing golf. And um, it's funny because when I was gra not graduate, I never graduated from college, but when I was uh, finishing my fourth year, um, I was playing really well and won the NC2A championship that year. Um, and, you know, I was talking to Julie about it and she's, I said, you know, you think I should turn pro? And she's like, yeah. She says, you should. She says, what else are you going to do? <laughs> you haven't graduated from college. <laughs> so um, she says, yeah, you, you need to go try it at least. And, and so I did. I gave myself that chance and um, had no idea how, you know, no expectations of how I was going to do. Um, I turned pro in the middle of 1980 and played six events and placed in the top five three times in those six events. So I figured I... I realized early on that I was supposed to be out there playing against the best women golfers in the world. Awesome. So another question from one of our members, Terry, is uh, what personal characteristics do you possess that got you through um, the losses in 1987, uh, 1989, both personal and professional? I'm assuming she's referring to uh, the earthquake and the uh, good, good question. Um, I think the basic thing about me is that I just never give up. Um, my dad told me, you know, from the very beginning, and my mom's basically said, you know, if you're going to go compete, you might as well win. So um, they, they taught me never to give up. And, and those are the, the traits, I think, that um, has carried me through the, my entire life, is that no matter what it is, even... I, we're putting together this obnoxious puzzle right now, as a lot of people do, and I want to put it in the box so bad because it is really hard, but I am not going to because I'm going to finish the damn thing, and uh, I don't care how long it takes, but I will do it. Yeah, no, we had, we had a similar puzzle here <laughs> at our house, too, so <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so we've gone to some of the lows. Uh, I know that what I thought found pretty interesting when you were talked to in a previous session, you know, the earthquake caused a lot of damage to your house and you had five wins in 1990, which was so spectacular. But to me, what I thought was really amazing is you saw those wins as just being financially productive because they helped you just help with all the bills. And, and it kind of made me realize in so many ways that this, this is your job. And that's, you know, that's how you saw it. 
Yeah, well, Rebecca and I went through the, the earthquake of uh, 89 here in uh, uh, San Francisco. We were actually at the World Series baseball game. And um, uh, we got home and saw the, all the damage of the house and uh, we eventually moved to Reno again. Um, and during that time, we closed out the uh, bank accounts and learned that we only had $2,000 in our possession. So um, fortunately through that winter in Reno, it was pretty mild and I was able to get out and practice almost every day uh, through the winter, which is very unusual. So um, because I didn't have any money um, and because I was able to get out and practice, I was pretty successful the next year. Um, we had bills of about, I don't know, 700,000, give or take a few here and there. And we were able to um, pay for the damage of the house, get it, put it back together, um, and buy a new house in Reno uh, and actually pay off everything um, that next year because I, I won over $700,000. Consequently, at the end of 1990, we were sort of right back in the, in the same place. We didn't have a lot of money, but we didn't have any debt. And that was huge. Um, and we were so grateful and thankful that um, we were able to put it together and, and, and do really well in 1990. So um, going from the, the, the tough times, I'd love to take us to uh, a super big highlight for you, which was the 1992 U.S. Women's Open at Oakmont Country Club, uh, which is outside of Pittsburgh. So just as a, a, a little bit of background for everyone listening, in case they didn't do their research like I did, uh, Good after three rounds, uh, you and Julie Inkster were tied at two under, and you're both playing, you know, beautifully, pretty tight in the fourth round. Unfortunately, on the 16th hole, you had a three putt, and that gave Julie a two-stroke lead. So now it's two holes to go, and you're down two. So you tee off on 17, but there had been a lot of rain throughout the days. And once again, it appears the skies opened and they called a rain delay. And uh, so I want you to uh, share what happened uh, during this delay. Well, it was really a, a perfect timing because um, I had just three putted 16 and I was really, really pissed off at myself because I thought this could be the last time I get a chance to win a U.S. Open and going up against Julie has always been, you know, we're always like that. So I was really pretty ticked off. So we wa I went into the clubhouse and I went up to the locker room, beautiful locker room, uh, and sat and watched um, the Olympics that were on TV. And I've always obviously been attached to the Olympus Olympics in some way and uh, went up there and watched whatever it was that was on TV then. And um, it re-inspired me. Um, there were a few things that had gone on that day between Julie and I that got me all fired up too. So um, I came out with a renewed, um, you know, I got rid of my anger and I turned my anger into, come on, you can do this kind of attitude. Um, so uh, we went back out uh, later that afternoon and um, I hit my right, shot on, oh, before we finish the rest okay. of the story, I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to invite someone to help finish out this story. Okay. Oh. Sarah, do we have? Just give me one moment. All right. I had to put my specs on to see who's coming. Yeah. All right. And if you could turn your video on. Where are you? <laughs> All right. And you have to unmute yourself too. Hello. You can tell that this is not my uh, strong point. We can hear you now. <laughs> we can hear you. Now we hit start video. Well, it's great to be here. And to Shall I start? Mm -hmm. And particularly to say hello to Becky and, and Patty. It's Hi. Patty. Hi. How are you doing? 
Hi, Anne. <laughs> what a nice surprise. <laughs> we, we've been through a lot, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we've got some stories to tell. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm and delighted. Now, I'm involved. sure you can tell them better than I can. No, not really. Maybe get Becky with you. We've got her, too. Uh, I'm, I'm all right. So, so um, while we try and get a little video still going with Anne for everyone else listening, so the rain delay is over, play is resumed, and then uh, Patty birdies 17, which is an incredible thing. So now we're one hole down, one shot. Oh, there she is. There's the play. There she is. And uh, Patty now. Why don't you say tell what happened and then Anne, you tell what you did. <laughs> <laughs> so on the 18th, uh, 18th tee, um, I was up and I hit uh, my drive into the right rough. Uh, and then Julie hit her shot, hit her drive into the fairway, of course. And <laughs> then um, we got down to my ball and it was in casual water, right, Anne? Right. And Anne was, um, she, okay. she was my USGA official that was walking with our group and she took over and gave me the ruling for my drop. And Anne, you want to tell about it? She had a beautiful shot on the green. But meanwhile, there's always a little rumbles about how Patty could have that lie. When it didn't, we didn't know, they, a lot of the people who were there who didn't know that she was actually in casual water the casual water relief is going to your nearest club, nearest point of relief and dropping it within one club length of that spot, which you did very nicely, knocking it on the green. And we got to play again the next day. Yeah. So specifically, my, my two areas to drop the ball was either in the rough, which, which uh, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no such thing as rough in the rule book, right? All right. Right. So you go, you go to the nearest point of relief, and the nearest point of relief for me was back in the fairway. Right. Well, Julie, Julie was not happy with that at all. <laughs> and to this day, she holds that against me. And I'm sure she has said a few things to you, Anne, in the meantime. But um, so anyway, I got to drop my ball back in the fairway on 18, which was a huge advantage because I was in the thick, heavy, wet rough, and I probably wouldn't have been able to get my, my ball to the green. But since I had the shot from the fairway, I could hit onto the green, and I did. I hit it about 18 feet away from the hole, and I made another birdie to um, go into a playoff with Julie. And she, like I said, she, to this day, is still not happy with that ruling that you gave me, Ann. <laughs> I've heard about it, too. But I got that, you got, I got that little three by five inch book that tells me we were right. That's right. That's right. That's so all I told you were there to help me with that. <laughs> and you, and, and Anne, advantage of it. so Patty, I don't know if you appreciated this, but uh, Anne was actually a former president of our organization in 1979 and 1980. Wow. Well, see, I did not know that because um, I was probably busy trying to figure out what to do with our house that was mashed <laughs> up in the earthquake. <laughs> oh, that was 89, sorry. Yes, it was a little before then. Sorry. Uh, but hey, so on the Monday's playoff, I thought this was kind of, I, I obviously I know you won it, but yeah. at one point at 16, you had a five stroke lead. Like how did that feel going in? Like were you just <laughs> jumping up and down or were you thinking about 1990 and trying to calm yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it did uh, it cross my mind a little bit, 1990, where I uh, was leading uh, by about 12 shots at one point and ended up losing the tournament um, because I had um, hypo, I got hypoglycemic on Sunday. We had to play 36 holes, and I was just sick as a dog. But anyway, uh, it did cross my mind, um, and I started getting a little bit nervous, and I think that's why I bogeyed uh, 17 and 18 of the playoff. Okay. Um, but I did eventually win the playoff, and um, it was the biggest monkey off my back, to be honest, um, because I've, I've been close quite a few times, and 
was, wasn't really sure that it was going to happen. So the, the U.S. Open was a tournament that I'd always wanted to win because it was always played on the hardest golf course that we play all year. And um, certainly Oakmont Country Club is no different. So I have to um, ask you, when I was doing my research, uh, and for those on, in, in uh, the WMGA, you should go to the USGA website and you just do a search on Patty Sheehan. And then what will come across, by the way, if I can show this, uh, if you look closely, <laughs> the video <I> <laughs> shows Anne and Patty. And there when I was looking at it, I was like, I, I know that pretty lady walking next to Patty. So it really was just such a thrill to, to yeah, see you there. Um, and I, I, everyone should go. But in addition to seeing Anne, um, you got to tell me about the knickers. Is there a history? Was, what made you want to wear those all the time? And I'm talking uh, to Patty, not Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, I'd always been one of those that sort of w wore something that was a little bit different. I tried to wear different golf clothes than everybody else. And um, uh, at the time um, that I s started wearing knickers was when Head Sportswear um, decided they were going to be making knickers and Payne Stewart was wearing them. And they wanted a female to wear them. So um, I somehow got hooked up with Head and the two of us wore our knickers together and uh, we loved it. Um, until, until the 1990 US Open when I couldn't handle the heat in them anymore. And uh, that's when I decided that I wasn't gonna wear them much anymore, but I still wore them periodically past that. But um, I love the knickers. The knickers obviously was a, a moniker that I had and people recognized me even before, before they would see my face. And Do we have so. Tammy and Diane design a pair in honor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they need to. <laughs> um, be fun. Another I know very special win is uh, your 1996 Dinosaur in Bisco. Uh, love for you to share that story and why it was so special for you. Well, there's a lot of reasons it was special. Um, it was, it eventually ended up being my last uh, LPGA win, and it was a major championship. But my parents lived there um, at, at Mission Hills, and we had a house there at Mission Hills, um, two doors down from my folks. Um, so it was a real special place, and, and we would go down there in the spring, and I would practice. And um, I, I Always wanted to win the Dinah Shore too. Uh, loved Dinah and what she did for women's golf. Um, and because my parents were there, I'd always wanted to win in front of them. And um, the time that in 1996, my dad was just diagnosed with um, cirrhosis of the liver and he was not doing very well um, at the time. And I felt this need that I, I had to get this wind under my belt because I wasn't sure how many times he was going to be watching me in the future. So um, I was, you know, for that reason alone would be a special win. Um, and it was, it's a place that, that um, I used to go to in college and watch women's golf. Uh, and it was just, it, it was just that place that um, you loved you know, because of the golf course, it was wonderful, and Dinah was wonderful, and the sponsors were great, and Ouch. I mean, just the, the crowds were terrific. It was just the whole ambiance of that week was wonderful, and I always wanted to win there, and so I had my opportunity. I uh, um, almost gave it away on 18. I was uh, up by a shot and almost hit it in the water off the tee, and then I hit it in the bunker, and then I hit it um, – <laughs> hit my third shot out of the bunker on the left side of the green. And if you guys know anything about that green, it's probably 125, 50 yards uh, across uh, sideways. So my shot was on the left side and the pin was all the way on the right. And you have to go over this giant, you know, buried elephant. And I mean, two putting from there was like almost impossible. And so I hit my first putt up there about 12 feet, which was pretty good, I thought. 
And then I just stood back and waited for everybody to finish um, because I was trying to make that putt to win the tournament. And I went over to my caddy and I said, Carl, you cannot believe how hard my chest, my, my heart is beating out of my chest. And he says, well, wait till you make this putt and then we'll really feel your heart beat. And which was the perfect thing to say because he had that, he planted that seed mm -hmm. that I was gonna make that putt and, um, and it, it went in, thank God, because I didn't want to have to go into a playoff. <laughs> God. Um, I know we're starting to get late, but, but it, we're on 30 minutes. But I, I really would love for you to um, talk a little bit about Rebecca and your kids and kind of explain why you left golf, because it's a pretty amazing story for us women uh, who have also had to make that choice between career and, and children. Yeah, so I met Rebecca about halfway through my career, and, um, you know, she had always wanted to have kids, and I had always wanted to have kids, but I figured that that would never happen uh, until I met Rebecca, and then uh, for years, she, you know, was working me, you know, come on, let's, let's have some kids and have kids, come on, let's time, I'm like, it's not time, I still have more to do, and yada, yada, so, um, my clock anyway, was ticking. Her clock was ticking. Mine was too. Anyway, we were uh, really fortunate to uh, adopt two children, um, babies. They were from birth, um, and they're biological brother and sister, 100%. So um, really lucky to, uh, to find these two beautiful children. Um, and while, uh, you know, we were trying to parent these two babies, I was still playing the tour which was very difficult for me. Um, you know, she was taking care of the kids and I was out playing golf and practicing. And when I would be out there playing golf, I would have these maternal things going, <laughs> I, I, I need to be home with the kids. And then when I was home with the kids and Beck and the family and said, I should be out playing golf and practicing. And so I had this really screwed up, you know, sense of, what should I be doing right now kind of maternal mix up. So I wasn't able to play very well um, because I couldn't concentrate very well. So I just decided that um, something had to give. Um, I was not happy out playing anymore. Um, I just lost my dad. Uh, he passed away in 99 and uh, it, was, it was a tough time for me. Um, trying to play the tour. So I thought something's got to give and it's not going to be the kids. So I just, I went home. Um, I think many of us listening can, can relate to those choices. And uh, from uh, the way I've heard you talk about Bryce and Blake, it sounds like it was absolutely a win for everyone in your family. Um, so a couple more golf questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one of our, actually, our board members, Heidi Comaria, is going to be having back surgery, and she wanted to know um, what should she do to adapt to a new physiology once she is, gets the okay to get her game started again? <laughs> Have you had um, wow. her back surgery, Patty? No. Okay. Oh, I think maybe, maybe that was the basis of the question. <laughs> you know, Rebecca is a medical person. She might be able to talk better about that. But um, gosh, I don't know. Listen to your doctor and take it slow, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I've been really lucky and I've had a pretty good back my whole life. So, yeah. All right. So maybe that's, we'll, we'll work on a different question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. <laughs> uh, now, do you, uh, do you play? Do you play as much as some of us crazy girls at the WMGA play? No, I don't. Um, it's really funny because Rebecca has not really been a big fan of golf. Um, and then like, I don't know, two or three years ago, she just got the bug and she wants to play every day. And this is really breaking her back, so to speak. <laughs> I'll let you know. She wants to play golf every day. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to play that much. So she's got new clubs. I've got new clubs. And when we come out of this whole thing, um, we'll be on the golf course, uh, probably a little bit more than I was expecting. And is it true you like to play municipal golf courses? Yeah, you know, I'll play anywhere. <laughs> I don't care. 
I really don't care. I, I like municipal golf courses because there's no, um, you know, pretense. Um, and most of the people don't know who I am and, and that's fine. I can just go play golf and do what I want to do and, uh, not have to be Patty Sheehan, you know, hall of famer type of person. I can just go play golf. Um, it seems like when I go play, uh, really spectacular private clubs, um, it's a different story and I have to be the Patty Sheehan person and, and it's different. So, um, I don't mind playing Muni golf courses. It's, it's kind of fun. And, and, uh, you know, everybody should go play Muni's every once in a while. It's humbling. Yeah. Uh, from Jane Hines, she wants to know what is the best advice you've ever received? That's a good question. Um, I've, see, I've received a lot of great advice, but when I was 16, I got to play golf with um, Susie Burning, who, by the way, is going to be inducted in the World Golf Hall of Fame um, this, this year, I guess. Uh, so I got to play with her and uh, George Archer who um, played the tour, the men's tour. And uh, when I was 16, I, I hit a big hook and I had a big strong grip. And um, they told me, you know, you'll never be anything or do anything in golf if you don't change your grip. So I went right in to my pro, Ed Jones. I said, Eddie, I've got to change my grip because I can't play with the grip that I have. I can't, he's like, okay, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. I said, okay, I'll, you know, I will, I'll do it. So. He changed my grip to the neutral grip and, um, you know, I would go around and when I was driving, I would have my grip on the steering wheel and, I would, you know, when I was eating, I would grab my fork and I would practice when I was eating. I mean, I, I tried so hard to change my grip because, as everybody knows, it's that, like the hardest thing to change because it feels uncomfortable and it doesn't, feel, you don't feel like you're going to hit the ball properly. So. That was, that was huge for me. And um, neither one of us, neither one of them uh, thought I would ever do anything in golf, but I surprised oh, them. <laughs> hey, Sarah, I'm going to, um, just because Sarah's our tech queen, uh, were there some additional questions that come in that you could throw out to Patty and Rebecca? Sure. From Donna DeMarco, of the young players on the LPGA these days, is there any one player who reminds you a bit of you? Oh gosh, that's that's a crazy question. I don't know who reminds me of them. Me of me. Is that how this goes? I don't me? know. <laughs> I don't know. It scares me. I don't know. There's. Uh, I guess you know some of the um, some of the Korean players maybe because they're short in stature and the, they seem to never give up. Uh, but I couldn't. You know, I couldn't give you a name. Um, but I, but I still love watching the American girls because they hit, you know, they're tall and lean and fit. And I'd love to watch them hit the ball a mile. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't watch it a lot, but um, I still enjoy watching some of the major championships. Um, obviously, the U.S. Open I love. I love the, the Dyna, which is the ANA now. And, um, I, you know, I, I – it's still in my blood. I love it, but I, I'm not like super connected to the tour much anymore. Um, which you know, good or bad, right. that's okay. Lori Ann, did you have any questions for Patty? Yes, I wanted to know when you talked about uh, that the two times or the times that you do go out. I do want to know, Patty, how many strokes do you have to give Rebecca? A lot. <laughs> 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 um, I, we both play from the same tees. So I play from the forward tees now, which is really fun for me. And I have a, I, I don't have a handicap. So I, you know, I have to give her whatever her handicap is. And right now it's a 27, but it's, it's a 27 down from 36, um, last year. year so ago. she's improving pretty quickly and she's got a decent coach. She's not a teaching pro, but she's a decent coach. <laughs> <laughs> Going in the right direction. That's yeah. right. <laughs> All right, I have another one here. What's your favorite golf course that you've played? Favorite, my favorite all-time golf course is Cypress Point. And how about the toughest golf course you've ever played? Oh, geez. Uh, th that's a hard one. Um, 
I forget the one I, I forget the name of it. Um, it was up in Kohler. So, um, it was, it's black, black wolf run. That's what, that's black what it wolf was. Run. That was the hardest damn course ever. And I didn't like it very much. <laughs> and that was an open. <laughs> that, was well. a, that was a U.S. Open. Yeah. I didn't like that one at all. Well, we have taken up a lot of your time and we are so incredibly grateful for having had this experience. Uh, I want to thank Kenona. And I want to remind everybody um, that they are very generously offering a 20% discount. Go shopping, get something new. And it's a win-win because not only are they offering a discount, but then the same 20% gets donated to our foundation, our charitable arm, which is uh, mostly collegiate scholarships for really young deserving girls, uh, which is awesome. And I am so happy, Anne, that you got to join us today. It was a, such a treat <laughs> to bring you guys together after all these years. Oh, um, we miss you. Yeah, we love you, Anne. It's great to see you, Patty. Great yeah, to I'm see not, you. I'm not yeah, sure that Julie Inkster would have wanted to join in, but we <laughs> had, we had you. Yeah. <laughs> that I, I can remember. I, I always I say one thing. I can remember when we were at Oakmont. And you and I, Patty, went out to the front, out the back, and we found Becky. And she, she showed she showed her one of the charms on your bracelet or something. And That's she should have been inside with us, and today she would be. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. Good to see you both. I also, you too, I also remember us drinking champagne out of the cup. Do you remember that? I think yeah. I have a picture of you and I drinking <laughs> out of the good, cup. Good, good. Oh, yeah. I wish we would have seen that. Maybe the next time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case I didn't say it, uh, the code for the discount is WMGA20. And we'll be sending out a, a thank you note to everyone who was here today. Um, thank you. And uh, this was number one in our swing series. And we'll have uh, some more coming out. But Patty, Rebecca, thank you so much for your time today. It was thank our you. pleasure. Thank you so much.